Okay. Okay. Um, oh. Yes. So I'm Sergey. I'm working uh, um, in, in Parity primarily on uh, everything that relates to WASM and uh, in particular on smart contract module uh, for SRML. And now I'm going to give you a quick uh, introduction uh, to the, this contracts module. Yeah. So before we start, I want to say uh, that uh, we are speaking about a uh, work in progress piece of uh, software. <laughs> and not all details are worked out. And some things may change, other things can be removed, and uh, something is not yet implemented, so bear with us. And yeah, but that doesn't mean that the chain uh, with the smart contracts module is really attackable, but it's not secure at this particular mo moment, like not 100% secure, yeah. Um, having said that, let's take a 1,000 foot view. Um, yeah, so uh, the smart contract module uh, model we implement is account-based. Uh, so a contract, um, like, it is a special kind of account that has balance code and its own private storage. And um, a contract can be created uh, or called by other accounts. When called, uh, the code of uh, the associated code of that account of that contract is executed, and this code can execute different actions such as modifying um, modifying storage or calling other contracts and creating uh, new ones. And this, uh, like, contracts, uh, this code can also interact with uh, Ogil, other modules uh, uh, in the outer chain, in the SRML. Like, and the code of contracts is represented, um, yeah, you guessed it, in WebAssembly. And, yeah, um, so contracts, uh, are implemented as a SRML module, uh, which which means that you can add your like uh, you can add this module to your SRML chain, and this SRML contract uh, follows design principles and tools uh, like and uses tools that SRML uses, and uh, like all. So all these nice things like metadata generation is available, and there is even more support uh, like special UI for interacting with contracts. Um, yeah, uh, because uh, the contracts module is built around SML, uh, the contract module inherits the notion of uh, an account. So uh, the contract module just uh, like it, it doesn't define the account by itself. Um, so, and account in SRML implies a balance, and um, the contract module just adds, attaches uh, some code and storage to it. Um, um, it's worth noting that a contract must have an account, but account can exist without a contract, uh, and it's possible to like to get the contract removed, but uh, still, like, while the, its associated account uh, survives. And, yeah, the contracts uh, module provides the following interface. Yeah, so the first thing uh, you do to, in order to use the smart contract module is to, uh, you put uh, the contracts code on chain, and for, for this we use um, something called put code func function. Uh, which takes code as a parameter and uh, it gets the hash of the code, uh, checks if the code uh, is already deployed uh, by hash, and that's it. Um, 
And if there is no that, uh, such code, uh, like, uh, then the module validates the code, instruments it, and says uh, uh, in the code uh, cache by the hash of the original code. And then, uh, yeah, uh, instrumentation is required since we need to insert gas uh, metering statements and other things that are required to make uh, WebAssembly execution deterministic. Um, it's kind of not that hard. And um, we will talk about gas metering uh, in a bit. And then after you put the code uh, on the chain, uh, then uh, Instashade goes uh, and um, like we Instashade a contract with the given uh, code hash and s some value called endowment. And this just creates an account uh, with the associated code, uh, transfers funds to it and runs the initialization code found in the uh, this deployed code. And yeah, after that we are ready to just call a contract. Like, um, we can send transactions, uh, send extrinsics to like to uh, like this contract module, which will in turn execute, uh, like uh, will uh, will run the code of the newly created contract. So yeah, gas. Um, there is this problem or like halting problem. Uh, you can't just let users run uh, like arbitrary code, uh, like uh, because uh, like the first. Uh, infinite loop will basically break your chain. So yeah, we use uh, this gas metering, nothing too fancy here. And uh, in order to start the execution, the I region, uh, that is the center of the extension space for gas up uh, to some limit specified by the sender, and gas is required to be paid uh, for putting code, instantiation, and call. And each action performed by a contract is charged by a certain amount of gas. Um, unlike the Ethereum, uh, block gas limit and gas price are fixed uh, uh, as a field, uh, basically in storage of SML contract module. And for the initial time, uh, this would be set up by the governance system. Um, yeah, all fees for interactions with the outer system are paid in gas, so there is some conversion rate supply, uh, and they can be uh, lossy. Um, and yeah, and also if the transaction or exchange runs out of gas, the execution is interrupted. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, by the way, uh, this is the only module that deals with gas, so Substrate doesn't provide any ways to like meter your, your execution, so this logic is implemented uh, within the uh, smart contract module, and uh, yeah, there is no change to, for example, to VASM engine. Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah, then there is this thing uh, called execution context, uh, which is basically uh, when a contract is invoked, uh, then the execution context is created. And uh, this in the execution context uh, at, is attached to like this particular contract that is called. And um, when, uh, when you create um, execution context, uh, it takes some input data, which is, uh, can be used uh, in the contract, and it can also return output data. Um, the context has a WebAssembly instance uh, created from a WebAssembly module encoded in its associated code, and um, this instance has memory, and uh, this instance is transient transient, which means that like, if we create another execution context, the new instance will be created and new memory will be created. And after uh, the execution context is done, then uh, like everything is wiped up. But it also uh, has access to storage of that particular contract, a key value store. And the data in this store is persistent, um, which means that uh, other invocations to the same contracts will be able to read updated storage. 
and uh, we use fixed size keys. Uh, but unlike, for example, Ethereum, um, CERML contract has variable sized uh, values. And at the moment, it's possible to have zero <laughs> sized values uh, for whatever re reason. And yeah, uh, execution uh, context also has a list of events that was emitted by a contract, so really similar. Um, and uh, it's also possible to dispatch an extrinsic from a contract. And we have uh, like a list of uh, dispatched extrinsics uh, in uh, this execution context. Um, code that executes within uh, the execution context uh, can modify storage events or add events, add the extrinsics to dispatched. And if the contract fails, uh, for example, divide by zero or tries to access uh, like memory that uh, outside of bounds, uh, all change just uh, that was accumulated in the execution context are uh, discarded. And yeah, so uh, like how it fits in the bigger picture, it just, Whenever an extrinsic uh, to the contract module is ex executed, it creates an execution context for the target contract. Then the code is executed, and a contract can call or instantiate another contract, and uh, this will create a new nested execution context. If the next uh, execution context succeeds, all changes are merged to the like calling one to the current. Uh, context uh, or otherwise all changes are discarded potentially the changes collected from nested executions as well um, and in the contracts modules uh, the failure failures are typically not propagating which means like if the nested context uh, is failed the caller context just receives a failure signal and then it it's up to him to decide whether it fail or to reco recover somehow, it, uh, so it's up to the caller. And um, if the top level context, like that is the context what, uh, what was called directly by the extrinsic, um, then all changes are committed to the substrate storage, like persistent storage, and the extrinsic uh, is deemed to be successful. Otherwise, all changed uh, are discarded and error from this extrinsic is returned. Um, you may notice that, um, yeah, you may notice that uh, uh, the execution context contains a um, list of extrinsics, uh, and if the contract extrinsic succeeds, all collected extrinsics are dispatched, and that means that the extrinsics uh, like you can interact with the um, like outer system. For example, you can send um, extrinsics to the governance module, like re registering yourself, like the contract as a council member or something like this. So it's really powerful. And yeah, so basically um, um, we are thinking, there are some ideas which we might implement in the future. For example, the first one uh, is really important, it's state trend. Ethereum uh, has demonstrated to us that uh, the scheme pay once uh, store forever doesn't work for a long time. And because of that, we want to add state trend um, uh, like as soon as possible. And uh, then we might want to add some um, RPC interaction with contracts. For example, extrinsic can return a result, so the top-level contracts can return data as well. And that might be really useful for uh, developers, the app developers. And um, yeah, we want to add that, and we want to add some uh, debugging uh, capabilities. Uh, like because debugging on chain code can be challenging, and we want to uh, like ease that, and we also want to uh, add dynamic linking because, yeah, Wasm uh, binaries are rather large, and uh, we want to like we're already kind of trying to minimize this um, 
by um, like deduplicating code, like uh, to dividing this uh, deployment storage on three parts, so in, where you in the first part you deploy a code uh, at first, and then um, you just um, instantiate uh, a contract later with this code. And uh, but we can do better with dynamic linking. And there is another one, for example, on chain compilation, um, like. Uh, of like trusted contracts. For example, uh, like on-chain compilation is a tricky thing and uh, it can be trivially attackable. Uh, there's a problem called JBOMs. Maybe you heard about that. Uh, we solve, like we are, like now we are solving this by basically using interpreter, but we are going to solve this by using uh, like one pass compiler that we, uh, is, is not susceptible for uh, JIT bombs. But the problem is that such a compiler uh, doesn't provide the best code quality. And uh, we can actually leverage the governance system to uh, mark certain code hashes as trusted and can be like this can be interpreted as a signal uh, to, for nodes to use the highest uh, tier compiler available. For example, it can be LLVM. This will give uh, like uh, better performance and this can give a lot of possibilities. Like we might need, we might like, um, like for example, there will be less need for extending substrate host for adding some uh, additional functions or something like that. Yes, so, yeah, time to build contracts. Thanks. Thank you, Sergey. Yeah. Thank you, Sergey, for, in, for the introduction of the, um, the technology stack that is underneath uh, Inc, or formerly called PDSL. Um, we are certainly going to misname it because we have gotten used to the name PDSL over the last six months. Um, so bear with us. Um, the, the introduction was especially important since um, I want to highlight one thing. The, um, the property that um, that we are no longer operating on fixed uh, storage slots is really important for us to do a really decent implementation upon uh, above that and so the ink uh, the basically the domain specific language we were building on it um, uses it heavily and it got influenced by that very much um, we are now going to present you a live demo which we were uh, we were planning to do a workshop but this format is more suited for a demo. Uh, you can you can still um, work work with us together, and Sean will take over. And Ted uh, referred to me some questions about PDSL whenever it's possible. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, exactly what we mentioned here. Maybe you can switch mics. This one seems to. Okay, um, so yeah, so uh, you know, I want to make sure that this uh, talk is interactive. You know, uh, we're up here. We know we're dealing with this very like you know bleeding edge technology, the smart contracts on substrate. Um, we want to make this interactive. We want you to follow along and you know build and deploy your first smart contract. But um, if you know for whatever reason you're running into issues or you know there maybe there are things that you want clarification, feel free to raise your hand. Feel free to stop us and we can work with you and again really make this more of an interactive uh, demonstration. Um, so if you haven't already, try to go to this link. Um, if this link doesn't work, maybe you can go on my GitHub. My name is Sean Tabrizi, I'm at the bottom. Um, and you can see that there's a new uh, workshop. Um, just a quick question, um, who here has followed the Substrate Kitties collectibles workshop? Okay, cool. So then uh, you'll be familiar with the format. Uh, basically we made something similar, but instead of going deep into module development, we go into smart contract development using Inc. Um, yeah, so, uh, and then w if you're doing the setup, um, you do not need to necessarily install Substrate. It's nice because we can actually do a deployment, um, but what you do need to install is a bunch of WASM utilities and basically our um, CLI, which will allow us to start a project. But we'll jump right into that. Um, we will, uh, over this course of, the example, um, of this demo, we will try to show you first deploying a contract, interacting with something very simple, like a flipper contract, which basically changes the, a single bool value back and forth. Then we'll try to build with you an incrementer contract, which basically has a value um, of a number, and then you can increment that value 
And we'll show you throughout that process different parts of the language, how you can store things like values, hash maps, how you can interact, create functions, all that kind of stuff. And then if we can get to it, we'll build an ERC20 token using this um, ink framework and all the tools you learned up to that point. Um, if at any point we're not able to finish this uh, full workshop, um, the content is uh, online and will continually be improved. So uh, we're looking for feedback. We'll, you know, there might be mistakes in there. We're very happy for you to uh, report that and talk to us. And again, make this a very interactive session. So if there are things you don't understand, please uh, raise your hand and we'll, we can answer questions, yeah? Okay, so to start, let's deploy a contract. Um, okay, this is the awkward, is there a mic stand somewhere? If not, I'm gonna armpit this. Um, uh, yeah, I can also try to talk really loudly. Um, thanks. Uh, so yeah, so um, most of you all should be familiar with the uh, Polkadot's UI, but first let's really quickly go into my console. Let's clear this. Let me also clear this screen. Maybe we will just make this its own thing. And I can make this bigger. Is that Command Plus? We, the, it's not oh, it's, oh, I need to mirror. I'm sorry, I need to mirror my screen real quick. One second, display. I blame Sergey for this one. Um, mirror displays, right, and then I have a terminal window, yep, and can you all basically read that as best as possible? Okay, let's clear your screen again. Um, okay, so I'm in my desktop, I'm gonna create a new uh, folder, uh, and then we'll just say like uh, contracts, um, and I'll change that contracts folder. Um, okay, so um, I've already installed the Ink CLI, um, and I can create a new project really easily with that. So I'll type in cargo contract, uh, new, and then um, for this new first contract we're gonna um, put on the blockchain, we're gonna um, call it Flipper. And again, it's the most simple contract you have there. And if we look, um, it will create a folder called Flipper, which we can move into. So maybe do code Flipper. And we'll kind of walk through this project real quick. So let's open up the, pro yeah. Yeah, that's the CLI tool. So at the very, I think the last step is to install the um, contract CLI, or this thing is called like uh, Cargo Inc. or Cargo Contract, um, and that's what you did. That it's a cargo plugin, uh, and it's really not done very bleeding edge. It basically just supports this one comment so far, uh, so don't even try to use anything else. Um, so you can see it created some files for me automatically. Um, let's walk through them really quickly. First, there's a cargo config file, which um, will actually um, do some configurations for when we compile our contract to Wasm. Most importantly here, there's this uh, flag called overflow checks on, and this will actually kind of implicitly um, make sure that all math uh, done uh, in the contract is safe math. Um, we have a few questions. Bigger? Yeah, yeah. Can you make, yeah. Even bigger. Is this? Okay. Okay. Um, so, you want to use the light theme? Oh god. How do I how do I even do that? Let's see. View command palette. Light. I, I'm gonna try oh theme. Preference color theme. Uh, light. Okay, is this better for everyone? Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, it burns my eyes, but it'll it'll work. Okay. Um, so basically, yes, yeah, so but the main thing is here that um, when, you, uh, when you have this flag on, all the math is safe. So you don't have to necessarily do things like safe math or build extra functions which do checks. Here, um, if ever um, some math overflows, uh, the contract will panic and as mentioned, the state will revert and it's really nice. Uh, so the Rust default is uh, for debugging. You, you already have safe math basically because um, overflows will panic. But for release modes, they decided to not do this maybe for, uh, for performance reasons. So we currently have to opt in for that. And that's how we do. Yeah. Um, you can see here, all right, so moving on, we have a source folder with a lib.rs file, and this is where actually our the main contract lives. You can see here that we have a basic flipper contract, and we'll actually walk through more of the syntax, but just a quick, a quick overview of like kind of the structure of a contract. You can see here we have some storage value, um, a bool in this case. We have a deployment function, which sets that bool to false when you first deploy the contract. We have um, a flip function, which will you know, set the value to something different, and we have a getter function, which will um, not only print uh, a value, which is something kind of special we'll talk about, but also return the value as a bool. And then we also have some tests, so that's all nice. Uh, we have a git ignore, that's boring. Um, we have a build script, this is pretty interesting. So this is actually the script that will build the WASM file, and you can see there's a bunch of different steps. I think we'll talk about the steps later, but know that this is what's used to actually build uh, the WASM which you put on chain. Cargo toml file is boring, and a Rust tool chain is kind of boring too. So let's uh, real quick jump in and actually build this contract. So first thing I'm gonna do is uh, run, oh, I need to, um, kind of annoyingly, I need to make the build script executable. 
and then I can actually run the build script. You can see that it will automatically pull using the cargo tumble um, um, the ink project and then use that to build. Um, and so while that's building, the other thing, yeah, this should be pretty fast actually. So unlike uh, Substrate, which is a much larger project, I think ink uh, projects compile quite quickly and uh, that's, that's nice. Um, so after we, we build here, we'll see some new files being generated in the target. And that's what I'm gonna be waiting for real quick. Hey, um, who, this so far is able to follow along? Yeah, we have some questions too. Yeah. yeah. Create for core. Okay, he can help you. Is there another question in the back? Yeah, so uh, we will talk about that, but uh, I mean, again, th that this is, uh, it more, this is a very much that print line is a very debugging thing. So you can actually not deploy a contract with the print line onto a production chain, but for debugging, we introduce this thing which will help us kind of not only demonstrate here, but also allow you to figure out problems with your own contract. So, give me one more second, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, of course. Also, you might have noticed that the print line and the syntax around it is pretty ugly. That is done on purpose to not make you feel happy about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here we've run the build script, which builds all the different WASM files. You can see a bunch of different files got created. Um, and these are all parts of a different uh, process, which ultimately generates the final WASM file um, that we actually use. So basically, we generate a WASM file. We, um, we turn it into a WAT file, which is a more like human-readable format. We uh, change a line, which is some, a detail we're gonna glaze over for now. Then we compile it back to WASM, and then we prune the file to make it smaller, I believe. Um, and then the other thing, so we have this final like flipper prune.wasm, which is what we're actually gonna put on the chain, and we also have this flipper JSON. This flipper JSON describes the ABI for our contract. So, control A, KF. Yeah, so you can take a look real quick here. There's this JSON file which describes the name of the contract. You get here are the different function selectors. So you have like message, the flip, and the get. Um, and later we'll introduce things like if you have um, you know, deployment arguments um, or if you have events, this will all show up here as well. Um, we had a question, is that still? Yes. He's broken? The then I think that you should, you should tag team together. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Oh, okay, well then you, again, best we could, I will be showing you stuff and try your best to follow along, okay? Um, okay, great. The other thing we, um, I mentioned before was that in our, uh, yeah, in our contract, we have a, um, a test that we can actually run. And so I want to do that real quick, too, to just show you that um, you can test your contracts, kind of make sure, like, sanity check that it works as you expect it. So I can do cargo test uh, features uh, test env. And basically, uh, within um, Inc., we have built a test environment, which allows us to do off-chain testing of contracts. And I think Robin can talk more about that. Yeah, so the test environment is... Mm, more or less emulating what Substrate SML contracts would do in a very simplistic way. It's not, it's not file in any way, it, it, it still can be extended quite a lot, um, but it currently works quite fine for off-chain testing, so we actually can do that and we actually are also using it throughout the demo quite extensively. Um, and so you can see here, um, look at, we can take a quick look at the test. So again, the flipper contract, um, we, deploy the con we deploy the contract, we check that the initial value is false, we call the flip function, and we say the, initial, the change value is true. Very simple test, you can see it works. So if there was a problem here, for example, if we made assumption that it was true to begin with, we would see the test fail, right? So this is a really useful tool, again, for verifying off-chain, are things working as expected before you put it on chain. Okay, but now we have this WASM file, we have our JSON file, our ABI, let's actually deploy it on chain. Um, so I will go to Chrome and I actually I would need to set up another, um, let me see, let's do a new window real quick. Oops, not that one, I want terminal. Uh, let's do uh, new tab. Um, and then I will do uh, substrate dev to start a new chain. You can see I've, uh, it's, the chains have been purged. This is what we need to install Substrate for, but um, if you don't, haven't done this, it's okay, we'll show you what happens here. So if I go back to my polka.ui, let's make this a little bit bigger. You can see here I have, oops, I want it to have the sidebar still. Um, you can see here I have um, a blockchain running, and it's doing, making blocks. And you can see here that there's a special t um, section in the um, polka.ui called contracts, and this is what we'll be using to actually push code. So actually, give me one second, I will, try to clear some of the history here. So, 
now would be a good time if you have a quick question to ask. Let me refresh this page. What kind of chain state can you access in a contract? Uh, that's a great question for Sergey. But um, for now, I think that the, the chain state you can access is pretty limited. I'm pretty sure it's just like balances, and you know. But uh, I think we're looking to extend that. And of course, you can make call extrinsics. So um, you know, I guess uh, you can maybe access. I guess you can't access uh, things returned from extrinsic call. Yeah, go ahead. We are working on it. Yeah. I think. But uh, for now, I think the most common thing is you're going to be able to access your own contract storage. You know, and that's definitely something you can do. Within, the, within a contract, you can access your own contract storage. Um, okay, so here we are. So back, we're back in our chain. Um, and you can see we have this contracts UI. Um, is this big enough? Yeah, I think that's big enough for everyone. Um, so let's really quick just go through here. So here, um, we mentioned, Sergey mentioned that there's a kind of a three-step process. First, we put the code on the chain. Um, then we instantiate a version of that code. So you can instantiate multiple versions of the same contract if you wanted to. Um, and then finally, you call and interact with that contract. So let's do the first step. Let's actually put the code on the chain. So um, if we go back to uh, my desktop, and we go to contracts, flipper, uh, target, and we go to this flipper pruned wasm. So we pick that one. And then we, our contract ABI, we add the JSON file. And then we put some gas here, 500,000. I think this is a little bit more than you need, but we're just going to be safe here. And the caller needs to be Alice, because Alice has the funds, right? So let's deploy this um, contract. And you can see here, the code is stored in the extrinsic success. And we have a new tab now, instance, which now allows us to walk through and actually make an instance of this uh, contract. So you can see here that we've or it's automatically selected our WASM file, our contract, and we can call deploy here. So uh, as uh, Sergey also mentioned, uh, contracts are accounts. So that means that you have to give and the account that represents the contract enough uh, balance so that it doesn't get um, destroyed by the existential deposit limit. Basically, right, we automatically delete um, accounts that have a lower than a certain limit. So we need to make sure that give the account some balance. So we give it a thousand, which I think is close to that limit, and then we also deploy a contract with some really arbitrary number of gas. And let's press instantiate, and it's that easy. So hopefully if this is successful, yep, we can see a new, a new account is created, a new contract is transferred, and a contract instantiated. This is the important one. So now we have this call tab, which is basically a way that we can call and interact with this, con um, with this contract. So first, I think it makes sense to call get, right? We know that when we deploy this contract, the initial value was set to false. So uh, we will try to make a transaction to this contract and see that result. So uh, unfortunately, there's a small bug in the UI where uh, we have to set a value as one, but normally you wouldn't have to send any value to make a call, but here, we just set to one. And we're gonna do some maximum gas of like 100,000. Um, and what I'm expecting to here is when I call this contract, um, you might have remembered that we had this print line in the getter function. And that's actually gonna print out to our um, substrate terminal, and we're gonna be able to see the value. And this is again, the, the debugging tool that we've enabled um, with print line. So if we press call, and hopefully it'll succeed. Yep, transfers, success. And if we go back here, we can see, yeah, storage value is false. Do you see that in the, in the console, right? Everyone? Okay, cool. And then what do we expect? We expect if we call flip, and we click press call, it'll flip. Um, and then if we call get again, press call one last time, we're gonna expect to see true, right? Yep, storage value true. So here, again, as simple a contract you can make, you can, um, with one line, create that contract, build it, deploy it using the Polkadot UI really simply, really easy, awesome. Everyone along the ride so far? Yeah? Any questions so far? Yes? The gas and the existential deposit is all in like the most atomic unit on Yes. System. It uses, yeah, whatever, it's, like, it's called the units, right? In balances right. module, yeah. Okay. Yes, another question. Yeah. Why is, why is reading the, the, um, the states require gas by calling the get function? Why does it Yeah, so um, what I'm doing here actually is not calling a view function like you would expect in Ethereum. What I'm actually doing here is making a transaction. Um, you, uh, we don't yet have a view function thing, but I think we're, looking, we're thinking about building an RPC, which allows you to m maybe just call the things without any gas. But um, for now, this is what we're doing. We're actually making a transaction. And as you may know, yeah, this is that. Also, it's currently not implemented in, the, in Inc. So we are, we are working on it to, um, like the uh, API uh, JSON file, to uh, make Inc generate some file to, make, to, to improve the experience of accessing certain values in it. Maybe this is not going to work. Substrate, uh, collectibles, workshops, fine. Okay, so now, I'm gonna, so now we're going to start actually um, 
building a new contract, which is this incremental contract, and through that we will start from scratch and we'll actually start to add some uh, logic and we'll talk, walk you through the process of uh, getting that all working. So let me find my own repository, because I think you're right, this link does not work and I'm very upset. <laughs> um, but if, uh, if you can make it to here, that would be great. Does, has everyone been able to find this page or do we need more instructions there? I think hopefully everyone can get here. Um, but yeah, we have a, so basically, and if you're familiar with the um, Substrate Kitties workshop, uh, we have built this Substrate Contracts workshop using a similar framework and a similar idea. We're going to walk you step by step, teach you the things you need to know, and get you a working uh, contract at the end of the process. Um, so as I mentioned here, uh, we just, um, what I showed you here, walked through this entire getting started page, running the Substrate node, deploying your contract, calling your contract, etc. right? So this is uh, all the things we've done. So now it's time to jump into the basics and talk about um, uh, building your first contract, the structure of contract, etc. Yeah. One thing though, um, who of you all knows Rust? Okay, that's quite a few hands. Um, we are going to explain some uh, nitty gritty details about our special syntax in accordance to Rust. So we, we try to design the language to be as rustic as possible, but we still have to make some explanations here and there. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so then um, just to give you an idea of what I'm about to show you here is we're going to be building this again incrementer contract. The incrementer contract, um, instead of having a bool, has some value and then users can call and add to that value um, with some input parameter. And we'll also make it so that you can use a hash map so that every user has their own uh, value which they can increment. A very basic um, use case and it, it transitions well to the ERC20 thing. Um, throughout that we'll talk about building private functions, safely getting these values, um, again, we talked about safe math a little bit already, but um, we'll do that again. So to really get started here, what I'm going to do is again create another project. Should be pretty easy. Let's go back to here. Um, so what folder am I in? I'm in the. Yeah, okay, cool. So let's um, make a new project here. So contra, uh, cargo contract new um, incrementer, and let's code incrementer. Right, and let's open this big again. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of all this because that is the flipper project. Um, basically, that's what gets put into every starting project and we will instead copy our uh, contract template. So let's copy this real quick and maybe we can talk about it. Um, so maybe, I, again, I have here in the tutorial a little bit of conversation about ink, about the layers. Is that something that you would want to talk about right now? Maybe just a quick overview? Yeah, sure. Um, I would be happy about that. So we we, we designed ink to be like a little bit from the architecture be like an onion. On the ground layer or on the core layer you have core which uh, serves as the what it is core abstractions like it, it features data structures that are working on the storage. It defines certain things that are storage. Um, it also um, allows for storage allocators. So in ink we can actually make some dynamic allocations on the storage. Not that tested well but uh, it should be possible and some other things around that and then there is the model layer it's a, be a thin layer on top of uh, the core layer it's heavily inspired by Fleetwood which we've already um, talked about in earlier um, one of our experiments from earlier and it's um, more or less a virtual structure of a contract like a data structure that models a contract and it serves, for example, for the message dispatching and so on. And on top of that, it is easily possible to uh, define your own um, language, basically, that works on it. So you basically compile this uh, language to the PDSL model and PDSL core abstractions. And Ink is just one of many languages that is possible to implement on top of that. Great. Um, so yes, and then let's really quickly look at the, um, the Ink template. So um, if we just look over here, I think this should be mostly familiar to people who have developed on um, smart contracts on Ethereum. You can see here we have um, the main, so I guess everything is wrapped in a contracts macro. So that's basically where all of this uh, language code uh, lives. Um, and the core of that is a struct, uh, which is the name of your contract. And that's where all of your storage lives. Um, on top of that, you implement a deploy, which is, has a deploy function. And this is basically your contract constructor. So like what, a function that executes one time when you deploy a contract. Um, and then, of course, you can implement any contract functions in the implementation of your struct. Um, and then, of course, at the bottom we have uh, the test, that if you want to do tests here. So uh, once we've gone and we've uh, replaced our project, uh, w um, our code with this code, 
um, we can now move on and actually start doing it. Oh, this is the wrong one. This is Flipper. Let's get rid of you. Goodbye. Let's don't save. Um, one of these things is, yes, our things. This is our template here. So um, the first thing we're going to teach you, of course, is how to actually store uh, a value. Let me move this around so it's more easy to navigate. So, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so storing a value should be, I guess, pretty straightforward. Um, basically, you def just define um, um, a storage value just like this. Basically, um, you have this um, syntax storage colon colon value, and then you can put the type that you want in there. Um, we support all types, pretty much. Um, all the primitive types in Rust, um, things like, yeah, go ahead. So you could basically, if you know Rust, you could basically think of that um, as the box of storage. Which is, uh, we, we should have actually called it box, I think, but we didn't. And uh, the generic power media, as you can see, it's one times it's bool, the other times it's u32. It, the only restriction is that it is encodable and decodable by our encoding uh, infrastructure, which is parity codec. Right. So um, we can just walk through the syntax real quick. So if here I wanted to make a, a storage value called value, I would say value. Um, uh, storage, oops, storage value, and of course I want the storage value to hold a U64, so I just put U64. And here we have initiated um, a new storage item in our uh, contract. Now what's really important that we need to um, set the initial value of this storage item before we ever use it. And it's something that actually I'm going to talk about over and over again. One of the um, assumptions we make here, again, because we have a box, is that these values are an option. So there may or may not be um, an actual value at any storage location. Um, and if we try to get the value where it's not initiated or where there isn't a value, uh, we're going to try to unwrap nothing and we're going to panic. And that's going to cause your contract to fail. But what it won't do is cause your compilation to fail. So you could write some code which uh, compiles perfectly well, you think, oh, this is great, put it on the chain and say, oh, wow, why is it not working? Why is there some problem? And this is something that we've actually run into a lot, building our own contracts using this uh, framework. But it's really important to make sure to always initialize a variable um, before you try to use it. Um, and again, this is what testing is, is great for, and this print lines and stuff like that is really great for being able to help kind of find these issues. But that's something I'm going to say over and over again. One, one design goal of uh, Inc. was that we fail fast when th something is broken. Uh, instead of doing some magic behavior here and there, we just say, okay, when this is not clearly defined and robustly defined, we just panic and nothing can hap happen then. Yeah. Okay, so then, um, as I mentioned, we need to initialize the value. So we can do that simply by setting the value. And you can see here I have a deploy function which has some input parameter called init value. And uh, we basically set that value as the init value. So this is as easy as it is to um, generate a storage value and set it. And let's, uh, we, so we have a test at the bottom which basically checks that we can actually deploy uh, this contract. So we'll do that real quick. I think this will be one time, it'll be a little bit slow because we have to build it for the first time. But after that it should be a lot faster. So let's do cargo test features test env. This is going to be one time slow. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, can you scroll up to the deployer? Yes. Uh, exactly. So I wanted to talk uh, about some speciality about it. So uh, some people that know or Rust already might got suspicious about this. We started with deploy function being a trait function after all, or as it looks here, uh, without arguments without, uh, besides mute self. And we just added something, which is um, because under the hood this is not actually a trait. Uh, we can simply extend this list. It's, the deploy function is, arbit uh, is of arbitrary parameter length. It's just a convenient feature. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so our tests pass. Great. And this is something that we'll be doing, if you're following this on your own, um, as you go through each chapter, there will be a test which is made to, that you would need to pass um, in order that you made the right code. So at every point you write some code, you can run the test. If it fails, maybe you can figure out what's happening. But here we have a simple thing which deploys this with an initial value of 5. Now the next obvious thing you might ask is, okay, how can I go and actually get this value? Right? So let me actually move to the next step. Yeah, we have a whole bunch of great content here. Um, probably won't go into as detailed, but again, this content's here and you, we're happy for you to read it. So now we want to get the value. So I'm going to copy this over here just because it has a new test and it has a new action statement. And basically what we want to do is we want to um, create a public function, uh, which we can do, and um, return the value. Um, but because we know that you know, we can't, returning the value within the um, contract 
context isn't actually going to give us any information. We also use this print line debugging tool to actually show, hey, um, it actually works. But within the contract execution, you can actually get this value and use it and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so you mentioned um, all the public and private functions uh, you can define are in this um, main like implementation of the uh, struct. Um, and one of the things we actually, and you'll see um, later on, we actually try to do is you can actually make as many implementations as you want. And what we do here is we can separate the um, public and private functions from each other, um, something like this. So uh, if we want to create another function, again, this is just going to type code, we can do another imp. And you can, we can define a function which is not public external. Um, as you might guess, when you have this marked as public external, this becomes a public function, something that you can call. Um, but if it doesn't have that, um, it's a private function. And you can kind of cleanly separate your code using some kind of uh, syntax like this. But let's go and talk about how easy it is to get the value. So, um, oh, actually, I need to probably copy and paste this print line uh, syntax because it is complicated to write down. So, um, this printing bug. So, we will. Yeah, I mean, yeah, here. So, um, one thing we're going to want to do is first um, print the value. So we can do that by actually just calling uh, self.value and then unwrapping it. This is the same thing, I think, as writing self.value.get, but it's implied. Is there something you want to talk about the magic of the implication here? No, it's just implied. So um, self.value should just act like the value it is wrapping. And in, the, in, in theory, you shouldn't even use get. Yeah. Maybe we even remove it. Um, so we have self value, and then of course we want to actually return the value, and we'll do self that value. As I mentioned before, um, you know uh, the get function returns a reference, so we need to unwrap, we need to dereference it in order to actually get the value. And so something as simple as this again, just calling this should pass our test. So let's do that real quick. So cargo test. Oops, we have failures. What did I do? Use ink memory format. There's something more happening here. Increment undeclared type or module. Did I spell this wrong? Maybe you've got no. Did I s this is live coding, guys. We are, oh, here. Did I mess up a colon? Print line format value, expected colon, unclosed limiter. Did I copy paste something wrong? Line 23, I think. Oh, perfect. Oh, my gosh. How does it do that all the time? I feel like this happens all the time where it um, deletes the parentheses. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. Yay, okay, it works. So basically our test here basically deploys the mock and then gets the value and, and shows that it is the initial value. Our test works, it's great. Um, let's keep moving forward then. Um, next thing you might say is, okay, how do we modify this value, right? Um, so we, now we have a value, we can get it, but writing and changing that value is really what's interesting, right? So um, maybe we quickly take a look at the test. I think talking about the test is always the best. So what we're going to do is we're going to deploy, uh, deploy our contract. We're going to get show it's five. That's what we've done before. And then we're going to call this increment function. And this increment function um, takes a U32 um, uh, and basically adds that to the value. So if we, press, if we do inc 42, we get 47. If we do inc zero, we get the same thing back. And this is what we're going to be showing and adding right now. Um, yeah, so basically to increment the value, uh, it's really, really simple. Because we know it's initialized, uh, we can immediately interact and touch that value. Um, and so all we need to do to basically change it is do self.value plus equals by. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and this is as easy as it can be to go and actually touch um, the storage value. So if we press uh, compile, bot, we'll see it works. Yep. So as simple as that, we can go, take the storage value, increment it, and uh, then call it and get it back again. Okay, any questions so far? Everything kind of makes sense, right? What we're, we're doing here step by step, creating, new, um, creating a new storage value, deploying that value, getting the value, incrementing the value. All pretty straightforward stuff. Um, the next thing we're gonna introduce, if there's no further questions, is storage mapping. So here we have a single value, and everyone who calls this contract is gonna increment the same value. And people are gonna be like, well, I want my own value. I want to, I want that only I can increment my value. And you might, that's a very common um, pattern in contract development in general, right? You have some protected uh, storage value that you only you want to be able to touch. And so we're going to show you how you can um, add um, a hash map to your uh, contract. So let's copy and paste this new template code. And basically we'll see here, um, let's look at the test again. So we'll deploy um, our contract. We will get the same value five, and we'll also call this get mine, which is your own uh, value of that um, 
uh, your own value, and we just see that it's also five. Although I think I changed this, so it might be z zero instead. I think we're going to change this to zero. I think this is a bug, <laughs> but uh, we'll try. Um, so let's take a look at this. So um, it, it, do a hash map is just as basically as easy as doing a storage value here. So what we're going to do is add a hash map called my value. So this is my value. We'll do storage hash map. And then we'll do the two, um, the key and the uh, value pair. So the key here will be account ID, and the value will be U64. And uh, I mean, I think this is pretty straightforward, but one of the things we did um, kind of in the match background is we imported this account ID, which basically matches the account ID that we use in substrate. Um, and you can see that we're using it as the key to the value of a U64. Um, then, what we need to do is we actually need to do something um, special here. And this is, again, going back to this whole initialization. So um, here we have a hash map, uh, which every key has a different value, but all these values are not set. And we are not going to go through every possible key and set every possible value. So what we need to do instead is whenever we try to get this value or modify this value, we need to do a, um, a check, basically. Does the value exist? If it doesn't exist, maybe return some default value, which we know is a real value. If it does exist, return that value. And what we do that is through this um, internal function, again, an internal function here, doesn't have this pub external, um, called my value or zero. Basically, we will try to get the value of, um, of this hash map for any particular key. If the value is there, just return that value. If it isn't, we'll do an unwrap or we'll return zero, which is the default value. So you could return five, you could return 100, whatever, or you can even return some storage value. But here we're basically setting what is the default value to be returned for this hash map. And then whenever we call, um, like, I don't want to get the value of the function, instead of calling it directly with like dot get, we would call this my value or zero. So let's show you how that works real quick. Any questions there about the initialization? Again, really important that you don't. Yeah, question in the back. Account is spelled wrong on the top. Did I? Oh my god, thank you. That is a sharp eye. Is it storage or storage? Yeah, storage. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm, I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm making sure you're all awake. That's all good. Okay. <laughs> this is part of the plan, actually. Um, okay, so let's show that real quick. So first we're going to do is we're going to create this my value or zero. Again, we're going to try to get the value, unwrap it, and if it doesn't exist, uh, uh, do it. So we do like, like um, let value equals, uh, what is it, self dot my value uh, dot get, and then we'll have the input being the count ID. I think it's an ampersand of, right? And then we'll do unwrap or we'll return ampersand zero. That sound right? And then we will return uh, this value like this, right? You need a semicolon. I need a semicolon here. Yeah, yeah. So this this is makes sense to everyone. This this is a very simple but important line for using hash maps here. We try to get the value. If it doesn't exist, we put default value, return that value. And then of course we're going to create a getter. So now we can. Because we have this, we can actually create our getter, um, which if you did it the wrong way before, again, you'd run into all these panics and bad stuff. So basically, we can get the value. So we can do um, let my value equal my value or zero uh, for, and then we're doing, um, one of the things we're going to be using right here is an end caller. So I need to write it down, and then we can talk about it. Um, basically, this does exactly what you might expect. Um, we have the ability anywhere within the contract logic to return who the current caller of the um, contract is through this end caller. Um, and this is useful for something like this. Like I want to get my value, so I don't have to have an input here to specify who I am. I can just call it. We know who the end caller is. We can call um, that getter. Is there anything you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the, the env dot syntax is a little bit special. Um, it's uh, actually imported from the model layer, one layer uh, below. and it serves one very important purpose. Uh, there are certain environment uh, functions that we may be allowed or not, depending on if we are allowed or if the message is allowed to mutate storage. So if it is either uh, ampersand self or ampersand mute self, and this functionality handles that. So whenever you use uh, env dot syntax is the safe approach to do that. There are others. Um, more errors, not found this, oh, I need to write self, I'm sorry. Um, so let me talk about the code I wrote while I didn't have the mic in my armpit. Um, yeah, so uh, basically we, we, again, we, we um, get my value using my value or zero. We don't call it get directly, because again, bad things, right? This, I can't, I can't uh, overemphasize that. Um, we do a print line, again, just to help us debugging, um, and then we return the value at the end. Um, and you can see here our test pass. So 
Um, I, it was, in fact, an error in the code, so I have to remind myself to do that. But um, because we say um, uh, uh, unwrap or zero, the default value will be zero here. So let's just do something real quick. Let's make this unwrap or five, like it was before. Um, and we can actually um, see that, uh, if we do control S, that it will also run. Yeah, so um, again, we're setting some default value. Something else you could do here if you want to be more fancy was you could do um, unwrap or, and you could do like something like uh, self.value, uh, right? So you could make it to whatever the current incremented thing for the global thing is, that could be your initial value, some magic like that, right? So anyway, that's uh, for the reader. Um, yeah. Can you jump back to the code, please? I want to highlight two things. Uh, so at first, we are, with the core abstractions, we try to mirror as closely as possible the normal Rust data structures, which you can see. So maybe in future, we even have some, like, something like the entry API for HashMap. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and there it is. One very important detail is uh, we need to, while we need to uh, initialize the self value, which is a storage value, um, we do not magically need to initialize um, the hash map. This is because hash map and many other data structures in PDSL core, uh, in core, sorry, um, have some default initialization schemes. So you basically do not, do only have to care for storage value. I just want to clarify, I think, um, just to make sure there's no confusion here, that you might imagine that you might have to go in here and play self dot, uh, my value dot, something like initialize, but um, that doesn't happen, but you still, but it still doesn't mean the values within that hash map are initialized. Just the, the actual hash map itself um, is automatically initialized for you if we detect it in the storage. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, again, following the same pattern, uh, we are able to store a value, uh, store a mapping, and return it. We've done all that kind of in one step. Last thing we want to do is now increment that value, right? So let's copy this template. Um, and yeah, so we have all our same code. And here we just want to do something like ink mine, right? So this is a function I call. It uses um, the uh, end caller to uh, determine who the person is and then increments their own value. So again, and very important, if we're going to modify, um, if I'm going to increment my own value, I need to make sure, make sure to use the my value or zero such that if my initial value is not initialized, that I get the default value and I can increment from that. Otherwise, again, panics. I talk about it every time. So we'll do like let my value equal uh, my self dot my value or zero. And we do it for the end caller again, m dot caller. Um, and then basically all we do is we insert it back in. So we can do um, uh, self dot my value dot insert. Uh, m dot caller, uh, comma my value, uh, plus by, right? Something as simple as that. Um, and you can see here that we can always call insert safely um, because insert will initialize the value if it's not initialized, or we just basically replace whatever's there. So we can take a look at the test. The test will um, check first the incrementer works. That's its own thing. That's the ink, and then my incrementer works. Basically, I will call set the caller to Alice. Um, uh, get the value is zero, add 42, show it's 42, add zero, show it's 42, um, still. And then we'll call with Bob a different account, and we've initialized these accounts up here. Um, and we will say that get mine shows zero. So it, it's, it's someone else's account is doing that. So let's do this, oops, and we have errors, <coughs> great. Uh, oh, I need to not return something. So I need to put a col semicolon. Where am I, here? This thing here does not return a value. And? Yeah, pass. So here we can see Alice and Bob both have their own value, which they can in individually increment, and everything is good. Um, and that is the entire part of chapter one. So at this point, you have learned to make a value, do a hash map, increment these values, do, right, do the right things in terms of initialization, with you access things, um, modifying it. What else did I miss? Yeah. Yes. So if you can be sure that the entry you are about to access in the hash map is already there, um, you can also use a very uh, um, a simpler syntax for that. Could, you, could we show them that, Absolutely. maybe? Um, so, where, where am I? Yeah, you can just scroll up. Should I make, you can close this window, if you, maybe that makes it. Um, yeah. What's this? One. So, um, well, I'll adjust your sy syntax, I do not want to run it. Ah, yeah. Can you, can you type it? Uh, it's uh, yeah. just self.myValue. And then we would, yeah, we, we, want, we still want to increase it. And then we have brackets uh -huh. for n.caller. 
we have to do a um, address here, or like do you have to reference it? Um, oh. No. No. Oh, okay. maybe. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, are, what are the references or not? Yeah, and then we can just simply do plus equals by. Yeah. And this is possible when you know, when you can be sure that nth caller is a, a valid entry in the hash map. But if, but if you call this and it's not, panic. <laughs> just, <laughs> I can say it every single time. Um, so it's kind of, I mean, I think the way that you write it here, this is pretty safe too. Uh, this is the safest way pretty much you can do it. Okay, so um, we're about to move now. We've done our incrementer. It works kind of end to end um, with our tests. Uh, we could deploy it. I think that's not a great use of our time right now. Um, but we're going to move on to try to build an ERC20 token. But before we jump into there, uh, we have any questions? We have a question. So, uh You can say no. So the the code uh, code the generated code tries to be as pretty as it can be. Um, it's it's quite a lot though. Yeah. So we, maybe later we can show it to you. Yeah. What's actually really cool is um, again, uh, Robin mentioned earlier that this um, Inc framework is three layers. We have a core, we have a model, we have a lang. So what you're seeing here is the lang, which is um, again everything wrapped in this contract macro. But you can still write contracts at the model layer, and I guess even at the core layer. Um, and uh, we actually have examples that show what a contract would look like. The same contract in three different forms. So you could actually take a quick look at what that. But it, I think it does expand. Yeah. So in the rep if you are really curious in the repository uh, of Inc. Uh, there you can find under lang and tests, uh, you can find some direct examples of code gen that is expected yeah. without uh, ugly uh, expansion of so other I, things. If I, if I want to hurt myself, I can just write pure Rust, use calling into the library, is it? If you, uh, if you want to live a dangerous life, you can just use the core abstractions, yes. Cool. Okay. Um, so no more, no more, uh, not any more questions? We can do ERC20 and uh, yeah. If I'm, am I correct? I have one hour left. Is that good? Is that right? 4:30. So when we end, okay, good. I mean, this is I'm, this is this is going like a breeze, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the you, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so again, we will start from. Oh, actually, we should. Um, the one section that um, I skipped over is the safe math. So um, uh, I haven't written uh, a good overview of this thing, but we kind of mentioned before there's this cargo config file. Um, we mentioned that Rust, you know, has a default thing where um, in release mode uh, it uh, it will not do an overflow check. It'll just it will just allow the wrapping, um, and we don't want that in contracts. So, I mean, you know that I mean, there's numerous things that around uh, Ethereum. We're talking about like safe math libraries that gets used in pretty much every contract, and any problems with overflowing that have caused bugs. This is all badness. But what's really nice is that with Rust and with this flag, we can automatically make sure that our contract. Um, will panic if ever there is an overflow. So you might, um, and what I probably will add to this uh, tutorial is an example where if you were to go to the incrementer, what would happen if you set the default value to like um, U64 max value, and then you called increment on one, right? I would expect something bad to happen. And I think that what we will show you, I don't want to show you right now, but what you can, what we can tell you will happen is that um, it'll panic. And you didn't have to do any special math here. We still just use plus signs. We don't have to use like check that or any of the, you know, safe Rust things, it just, it is safe because we have this flag. Is that an accurate statement? Great. Me too. Okay, so that's cool. And of course, you don't have to have this flag. So if you, if you do want overflow, if you do want wrapping in your thing, you can remove this flag, it's, it's option. But um, by default, when you create a project, we add it because I think that's the, the, the general um, most use case. Yeah. So, um, we, uh, so as long as you're using the CLI tool, you, you are pretty safe. Um, the CLI tool is expected to be extended quite a lot, so we also want to get rid of the builders age script because it's not that cool. And so that in the end, everything can be done through cargo, through our cargo plugin. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna skip the first step of this ERC token because basically it go, uh, what's very convenient and something that we planned hopefully is that the, e the, the template for the ERC20 token is very similar to this increment we created and I'll walk you through that real quick. So if we look at this, the, 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 right now we're starting, uh, our starting template for ERC20 which we'll continue to add on. It has two um, storage items. One is a total supply which is just the value and the other one is a um, storage hash map, which is an account ID to a balance. The only thing we've changed from the incrementer is instead of using a U64, we use a balance, which basically uh, maps to U64 in the background. Um, again, this is the substrate balance type. 
Um, and then in here we have a deploy function. Um, this is maybe something that we should call out. So in the ERC-20 um, uh, contract, uh, the mo most basic like, deployment or initialization of, of a balance is basically to set the total supply. Um, actually, let me pause. Let me go back up to, to, to the two values. So one we have is called total supply. This will tell you the number of tokens in the system. And you have balances. This is the hash map which will say for each individual user, for each account, uh, what uh, balance do they have of that token. And so when we deploy our contract, what we want to do is basically set um, an initial value for how many tokens we want in our system. So we can set like, you know, 100 million or we can set one or whatever. Um, we set that as initial value. We set our total supply to that value. And we can insert directly into the caller of the deployment function um, that initial value. So like if Alice deployed this contract, it said 1 million, she would get all 1 million tokens and that would be the total supply. Um, so this, again, really familiar to the incrementer, um, except for this one line right here. And then of course, within um, our contract, we have done some of the same stuff, where we have this balance of our zero. Basically, again, same thing, we have a hash map where it maps the balance. The balance may not be initialized, so we have to write this function which basically unwraps or returns zero. So the default value of, of a token for everyone in the system is zero. You could have it so everyone has one token, something like that, by putting one. Um, and then we have this balance of, which is a getter. It's exactly the same. And we have a total supply, which is another getter. So uh, what's really nice is uh, if you look at the difference between the incrementer and this ERC20 template, all we've done here is basically change names, which is nice, right? Everyone follow along? That thumbs up for everyone? OK, cool. So we, that's what the first step is. Basically, we give you, we, don't, we, don't, we make you rewrite everything. And I'm going to skip that step because I know how to do it. Um, OK. So now let's do a token transfer, right? So now we're going to start implementing our, uh, our actual logic. So what we've done in the setup here is that we've given the caller all these tokens. But these tokens are pretty not useless if you can't transfer them around, right? If you can't you know, give them to your friends or you know, whatever investors you have. Um, so, <laughs> um, so what we want to do now is implement a transfer function, which allows a user to safely transfer funds from one user to another. Um, things we want to check for, again, is if you call the transfer function, do you actually have the value you want to transfer? Um, and are we you know, correctly subtracting the value from the caller to the sender or to the receiver, et cetera, right? So let's jump in here. We're going to have a public function. And this transfers token from the sender to the two account. And we can see here we have a, um, basically, we only had the inputs are two and value. And of course, we, we get the, um, the, call the caller is our sender. So that's the from account. So when we transfer from one to another, we'll do that. Um, the other thing we're going to do, um, kind of as like a, we know what's going to happen in the future, is we're going to actually break this into two parts. So rather than just calling, writing that whole transfer function here in this transfer, we're actually going to some, create something called transfer implementation, which is a private function. And basically, if you know about the ERC20 token, um, you know that at some point in the future, we're going to implement transfer from, which allows um, users to transfer on behalf of. And we're going to have to call the same logic anyway. So rather than having to write it twice, we have this internal transfer implementation, which doesn't have any authorization checks, but does have a math check to make sure the from account has enough to send to the to account. But it does not authorize uh, if the from account can spend the funds or, or ask to spend the funds. Instead, we, this is a private function, so we don't need to do that check. We control when it gets called, and we can do the authorization check in um, this transfer implementation. Does that make sense to everyone? Anyway, so quick, quick hands, actually. I should have asked this earlier. Is anyone not familiar with ERC-20? OK, great. Okay. <laughs> um, so then hopefully I'm just telling you things that you already know. So let's talk about the transfer implementation. Um, one more thing you might notice here, this is just a small detail, but um, as a part of the ERC-20 spec, um, all the uh, functions you call return a bool. So that's why you're going to see some at the end, we return true or return false. Um, it's just an implementation detail. So first thing we want to do if we do transfers, we want to get the values from both users. So we've already implemented this balance of or zero. So we're going to use that to get the balance. So I can do let uh, from balance equals get oh, self dot get balance or how come you don't like me? Oh, not get balance, just balance or zero. Balance or of or zero, OK. Um, and we're going to get the from account. So from, I think it's, you have to use the ampersand here. Um, and then we're going to say let uh, to balance equals self dot balance of or zero two, right? Uh, and then. Uh, yeah, we can, we, we very, a hint, we use the balance of zero, again, important. Um, then we're going to do a simple check. So we're going to check, um, this, user want, this user wants to send um, a value amount. And so we need to make sure the from balance has that. So we should do if from balance is less than value, we want to um, exit early and return false. Right, this is again the bool. We're just going to exit early and then the rest of the function is not going to run. 
If it passes this test, then we can do a transfer, and that's really easy. All we have to do is insert those values, the new, new updated values, back into the storage. So we can do something like, uh, what am I doing? Self dot um, balance. What is the name of the thing? Is it balance? Is it balances? Oh, yeah, self dot, sorry. Where am I? I'm sorry, moving around. Self dot balances dot insert. Um, and I'll insert uh, from and then uh, from balance minus value, right? And then self dot balances dot insert. Uh, two, and then two balance my, a plus value, and that's as simple as that. Who ever this is makes sense to everyone? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, and then we return true at the end. That everything returns successfully. And then all we have to do then is for our transfer function is do the authorization, right? Which is like can, who can call this function? And we're saying um, when you call this function, the authorization is that we can make the from account whoever the end caller is, whoever the caller of the contract is, and that's the that's the authorization that you can call and transfer your own funds, right? So here we'll do uh, self dot, uh, what is it? What's the thing I did? Um, transfer implementation, yep. Um, and then we have the from be the m caller. So m dot caller. Uh, we have two and we have value. We're just passing directly just forward to the other one. We don't want to call them. We want to return the true or false value. Do I need two ampersands here? No, I don't. I don't think. And let's run our test. So let's look what our test does. So our test. Um, deploys um, a contract under Alice, deploys to have her have uh, 1,234 1, units, check the total supply is that, check the balance of that, and then we check the transfer now. So this is just checking the deployment works. Now if you want to check the transfer works, we give some initial value. We try to transfer more than she has, it fails. We transfer less than she has, it works, and then Alice has the subtraction and Bob has the addition. Makes sense, right? So let's, please, nope, env. Ooh, I need to do m dot, right? Oh, no, this is probably some other problem here. This is in the test. This m dot m test. Have I not brought in ev and Vindy here? Maybe, you, yeah. I think you just do. Just do it. Just do it. Bring what use uh, ink core env. Okay, let's try that. Okay, great. More, another thing I have to remember here. But yeah, you can see it works, right? So um, yeah, once we correctly import the end, we can follow. We can pass this test, and we see that um, it, you can't transfer more than you have, but you can transfer less than you have, or the same amount, and then the transfers happen correctly. We're all good. Nice. Okay, let's move on. Um, what's the next thing we're going to teach? Creating an event. So this is something that we haven't um, taught yet, but we do support events. Um, I think we'll let Robin talk, yeah, about this because it's something very cutting edge. And, and very emotional, very because <laughs> I, I was working on that the last days, and we, ah, uh, days, and, uh, okay, night, and, and it didn't quite make it into the demo, um, so we are not using this new cutting edge feature that we just merged in the repo, um, instead, I want to motivate you clicking on it, uh, so what you can do soon is um, this is just an example within the in ink uh, repo um, serving either, uh, as an example to just look at it and feel how the code uh, looks like. You define events very similar to Solidity just with this event keyword and then having within those curly braces the parameters you expect. And <clears throat> you can also very easily emit them using this env.emit syntax and Basically, that's all you need to do. Yeah. So let's talk, about, let's talk about some of the magic that happens in the background with events. So when you submit, um, if you've done runtime development, you're familiar with runtime events that you can put inside of your module and that'll get emitted. In the contracts module, there's a special event called contract, which is called, just called contract, which um, the input of that is some arbitrary evacuate. And so what we do in the background here is we basically serialize um, whatever structure we have here, pass it as evacuate, and then a module event is emitted with this value. I think what you'll probably see in the future, which is not supported today, and this is a very new um, system we've um, implemented, what you'll see in the future is probably something like the Polkadot.ui can detect, oh, this contract event got emitted, can take the um, byte value, and then parse it using the JSON file that we introduced, right, that has all the syntax of like the ABI, and um, be able to parse those events and show you like cool events just like a module would. With um, you know, with the 
values and the names of the values and all that kind of stuff automatically parsed in syntax. Um, for now, though, uh, we just when you emit an event, you'll see um, the event contract and you'll see a blob of bytes. And it's not very helpful, but it shows that it works. And, and yeah, again, we'll, we'll, we're working on it and we'll probably be continuing to work on it. Um, yeah, another thing to mention overall is that um, I think Ink is, a, is still a very new project and something that um, you could absolutely influence. So if you were using this and if you have feedback, you know, th this balances thing just got merged in um, today and we had a small discussion on GitHub about exactly what the format should be and that has actually influenced and changed what the actual end result is. So if you're interested in this contracts platform, if you're interested in um, making things uh, or like trying to talk to us about the ways that you think that it can be improved, absolutely we are happy to do that and we're happy to have you work with us. That yeah, great. Um, okay, so what am I doing now? I forget, I have completely lost track. So I'm, do, I'm adding an event, um, and one of these things is here. So I'm going to create an event. So here we have. So I haven't written um, instructions here, but I'll update it. Um, this is kind of an old way of creating an event, um, but uh, we can do that real quick. Let's in lib. We'll paste the code. Um, and so what we've done here again. This is a lot of this is hidden with the work that Robin has done here. But we have this enum event. And what we can do is create a new event in this enum called transfer. And uh, we can have transfer have a from, which is an option account ID. So one of the things mentioned here is that we're using an option for these uh, from and to on the transfer event because um, part of the uh, ERC20 spec is that when you first mint any tokens, that the from account is probably the zero address. So the equivalent in Rust is to like none, right? The, the account would be like the none value, right? Um, so with the two um, option account um, account ID, this is are you all paying attention? You need to help me here. Um, and finally, we have value, which is the balance. So this is defining the content of our event. Let's keep moving down. Let's see, if we have to do anything else here. Um, so now, um, when we deploy again, we want to. Uh, so let's now implement the deployment. Well, no, we don't have to do that. We just call deposit event. So another thing that gets, that's got added here that I didn't write, um, and it will be is automatically hidden by this new work, is this deposit event. Basically, this deposit event kind of wraps a little bit nastier syntax, which decodes the event and passes it um, as a uh, vacuate or a byte array to the um, actual contracts uh, module, but then it gets emitted. Um, but basically, I can pass in here an event. Um, so I can just call this deposit event. Um, and um, have it emit an event. So I'm going to have to call this in um, the deploy function. So when we first create the initial tokens, that is a transfer according to the spec. So we'll do deposit, deposit, event, um, colon, uh, transfer. So we're just going to make a new enum, and we're going to say from is uh, none, to is env.caller. Oops, call er, and then uh, uh, value is init value. Okay, so now we basically. Need event colon colon with the transfer. Okay, yeah, right. Event colon colon. We need to say that we're getting it from the enum. Thank you. Um, and then the other thing we're going to do is whenever we do a transfer in our transfer implementation, again we can just do a deposit event here. So deposit event um, event colon colon transfer. And then uh, from is from. Oh, I need to do. I need to actually wrap it in sum. Sorry, real quick. Because again, these are options, right? So it's sum from <laughs> uh, two is sum two, and then uh, value is value. And then let's add a semicolon. And um, yeah, we, we right now we don't have any tests set up for checking events, but I think we will in the future. Is that correct? Yeah, we we do, but it's not it's not perfect. So we we can actually query uh, with test environment um, which bytes have been received, but it's not that. Yeah, it's not not so usable right now. Yeah, um, you can see you can see I just forgot a sum around this. Please, that's the only thing. Okay, great. And so you can see here it was really really easy to create new events, right? And now we are emitting events whenever a transfer happens. We're again following the spec to the T. Um, the last thing I think we're going to do, I think this is really the last step in the process, is supporting approvals and transfer from. So if you, I think everyone said here is familiar with ERC20, but I'm going to very briefly talk about approvals. So um, what we've enabled here so far is users to transfer their own balance, but for the um, for some 
some further uses of ERC-20 tokens, it was nice to add to the specification the ability for other accounts to transfer balances that you approve for them. So you might imagine something like a decentralized exchange where you want to say, okay, this exchange can make trades on my behalf, but I don't want to have to escrow my funds. I want to be able to have maybe multiple bids open across different exchanges, and then whichever exchange triggers will take my funds from it. Um, there are probably some other use cases, but basically um, what you can do is we can allow a user to um, uh, to be part of an approval list. So we say like, um, I am some account, I let Robin spend 500 of my units, um, and then Robin can make a call, call we're using a different function called transfer from, where he specifies me as the from account, and then some to account, and he can spend on my behalf. Again, I've trusted him with my units. Um, so we're gonna implement that. And that is gonna be the end, and I think that's gonna be perfect. Um, okay, so, um, we're kind of doing, I think, a lot of steps here all at once because these are things that we've all done before. We just have to really kind of do the process to make the um, to make the uh, contract follow the the right. Um, what am I looking for specification? So first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new sh um, a new uh, sh uh, storage item. And the storage item is going to be a little bit fancy. So it's going to again be a hash map. Again, every uh, every person can specify a different allowance for another person. But the key of the hash map is actually gonna be a tuple. So again, Aya Sean can say Robin can have this much, or I can say Aya Sean can let Sergey have this much, et cetera, right? So some tuple of two accounts is gonna be the key, and then some value that that, that, that a tuple can spend will be the, um, will be the allowance. And um, we'll always follow the owner-spender flow. So whoever the first one the tuple is is the owner, and the second one is the spender. So we can really easily create a new um, storage item. So we do allowances. Is it allowances or allowance? Yeah, allowances um, is storage hash map <coughs> tuple of account ID, account ID, and then um, balance. This makes sense, everyone? This tuple? Yeah, easy enough? Okay. So that was as easy again to create um, a item here. Uh, we need to do some work to do the um, getter. So again, it's a, it's a, hash, it's a hash map, so we need to do this uh, getter here. That either returns zero or unwraps the value, so we'll do let allowance equals self dot allowances uh, dot get for the tuple of um, account ID, no, not account ID, owner, yeah, owner spender um, dot unwrap or, and then we return zero if not. Again, that, the default allowance, we yeah, we want ampersand on these folks too, but um, again, we can, we can set whatever default allowance we want, but the default allowance is zero. I think you don't want people spending your funds. Um, and then of course we need to return the value. So uh, oh, we just do allowance, okay? And then do we have to return maybe the star? No, I think just allowance is good enough. Um, and, oh no, we have to do star, yep. We have to dereference the allowance. And then um, now we can create a getter for the allowance. Again, hopefully I'm not boring you kind of redoing it, but you can kind of, again, see how simple it is to uh, write uh, new logic. So, um, so, we do, so we say like uh, let allowance equals uh, self dot uh, allowance or zero of account owner. Um, oh, we need to do a tuple again. No, we don't. It's, uh, you don't. <laughs> so we have to do a, a, um, owner, oh, you want to just. I know we uh, allowance or zero accepts owner and spender as the number as an untuple, I'm sorry, you're right. Owner, spender, um, and then uh, this will always return a value, and then uh, we can make a print statement. So we can, let's do that real quick. So we just do allowance. Again, this will help us debug if we ever wanted to. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna format it perfectly right now, but just do uh, question mark and we won't print the details of the owner spender, which say value or allowance. And then finally, we want to return this allowance. Um, and then uh, let's keep moving around here. Um, we've done that. Uh, we can create a new um, approval event because whenever you do an approval, we also fire an event. And this is also really similar. Owner is an account ID. Here we don't need to um, do an option on the account ID because um, for an approval, it's always um, two valid values for accounts, right? Um, and then value, it's a balance. Um, and we need to put a comma at the end. And let me see what else here. I have this, I have this, allowance, getter. 
So now we actually need to do the approve function, right? So approve function basically um, uh, allows some caller, that's the from, to um, create an item in this new um, storage. So let's do that. So we can say like let caller equals, or let's say let owner, because it's always owner is the caller, equal uh, end of dot caller. Um, and then uh, we want to insert a new value into the allowance. So the owner can always insert whatever they want. The allowance um, has no checks in terms of like, oh, does this user have enough balances? It just allowances allowance. So you can just do um, uh, self.allowances.insert uh, owner, oh, I need a tuple here. Owner comma spender, and then the uh, value that they specified. Right? And then um, we return true. And we can deposit the event. So we'll do deposit event, event transfer, oh, allowance. Is it allowed? Approval. approval. Yeah. Yeah. Who picked these names? Um, approval. <laughs> um, and then we will uh, do a owner is uh, owner, caller is oh, spender is spender, and values, and you probably don't need to do that if I think Rust handles if it's all the same. Um, okay, here, so that it should be all it takes to um, do this. And then finally, we need to do a transfer from. So uh, again, we very cleverly uh, built this transfer implementation, which we can use again to actually call the transfer from. As we mentioned, the transfer implementation doesn't have an authorization check, but does have a balance check here. So um, we need to do what, an authorization check here. And what is an authorization check in terms of a transfer from? Well, it's two things. It's one, that there exists um, an allowance between uh, the person who's calling the caller and the from account, and um, that the allowance is uh, less than or equal to the uh, uh, allowed value, or the, or the uh, value that they're asking to transfer, right? So we can do that really easy here. So um, let's do, let, uh, what do I want to do here? Let call, I, mean, I don't even need to do let caller here. Let's do, um, uh, so first we need to get the allowance. So let allowance equals uh, uh, self dot, and we have to very importantly remember, call allowance or zero, right? Not the direct getter. Um, and we call it for uh, the owner, which is going to be from, and the spender, um, the spender who's going to be the end caller, right? And then we're going to check that the allowance is, so if allowance is less than the value which you want to transfer, we return false. Um, if it's not, then we can just simply call, then we, can, we have to update the allowance. So we can do uh, allow, oh, self.allowances.insert. Uh, um, and we'll do uh, this again. So from env.caller, and we'll insert allowance minus value. This line makes sense to everyone. Basically, we, we're spending some value, we're gonna decrease the value. And then, we will finally do uh, the tr transfer implementation. So we do transfer, impl or self dot transfer implementation uh, between from, so here, the from is the from, the to is the to specified up here, not the end caller, right, to, um, and then value. Um, and this returns a value which we wanna so, and I might be missing some ampersands here. I think the Rust compiler will let me know what, when that is. So I think, yeah, here, it's expecting ink the ampersand, and this is in this allowance or zero. So let's do ampersand here, and ampersand here. Um, yeah, the compiler is your friend. Maybe you can think of the logic. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, this is probably this tuple needs an address thing too. No, insert doesn't. Insert does not, yeah. okay. And so then this other one, this, uh, this one. Before the tuple. The ampersand is before the tuple. Yeah, the, you've, I think you've done the mistake before, or like on the top somewhere. That's okay. fine, I'm sorry, can you tell me what I'm trying to do here? There's a tuple here. Um, oh, that's awful. Yeah, um, yeah, oh, somewhere uh, else, yes. Uh, So this is the, uh, let me just use the compiler. I'm sorry, y'all, I am doing this. So two, moving the borrow. So this one is messed up. Let's go all the way to the top. I'm sorry, debugging. 
Oh, no, expecting reference. So this one? Oh, yeah, yeah. And let's try again, and everything hopefully magically fixed. Nope, almost there. Um, expecting removing the borrow here. A typical Rust workflow. Yes. One more time. Uh, removing the. Uh, this is the one here. So remove, remove the two ampersands and move it to the front. Move it to the front here. No. What is, uh, what is the error? It's saying to, uh, to consider dereferencing spender. Do I need to do that? <laughs> Sorry. Oh my gosh, please. Yes, OK, we did it. We, <laughs> we made it through. So let's, we, we passed the test. So let's look at what the test does real quick um, and make sure that we are doing a standing check here. So um, we have the same test before, which is the transfer works, the deployment works. Now we have allowances work. So we have three users, Alice, Bob, Charlie. Um, first, we set the caller to Alice, and Alice deploys the contract with some initial value. Um, uh, we try to have, uh, so Bob does not have an allowance from Alice's balance, so um, uh, we can assert that uh, owner Alice, um, spender Bob is zero. And so if we set the caller to Bob and Bob tries to transfer a unit, we get a failure. Um, what we can do is have Alice approve Bob for 20 units. Um, and then uh, we check that the allowances reflects that um, that allowance correctly. Uh, we, we switch to Charlie. Charlie can't transfer on behalf of anyone because he, um, he hasn't been involved in this conversation. So you know, even if Bob has an allowance and we're transferring between Alice and Bob, he cannot um, transfer any funds. But if we call with Bob um, and we try to transfer too many funds, that also fails. There are lots of failure cases here. But if you do a smaller amount from Alice to Charlie, where Bob is calling on behalf of Alice, it works. And if we look, the allowance updated correctly, where um, Bob spent 10, so it's reduced by 10, and then we, um, Charlie's balance is increased by 10. And at this point, we have built a fully, com like fully valid, fully working ERC20 token on, uh, using ink on Substrate, and yeah, that's cool. Maybe we should test it. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, yeah, we should. Yeah, so let's deploy this thing, right? That's the, that would be the most amazing thing ever. I mean, you can look at the events and all that kind of stuff. So, um, do I dare, do I, do I, so I'm trying to see, if I, should I cop out and copy the working code I know is in the thing, or hope that this test did capture all the test cases? And I think I'll just try to, yeah, I mean, I, I mean live, so I'm, I'm gonna cop out a little bit. If there's something I missed, I would rather just do penetral solution and just make sure that this working code works. That's okay with everyone. Okay, so I've just copied what I, what, I, what I believe to be completely working code. We can just check one more time that it passes the test. Okay, and then we're gonna run build, right? So this entire time we've been, um, oh, I need to do ch mod plus x build. We need really need to fix this, and then build. So the whole time I've been compiling um, the like native executable, right? And doing tests that way, but now we wanna build the wasm. Again, build all those uh, target files. So we'll see this folder pop up. Um, I'm gonna reset my node just cause um, Alice ca often runs out of funds. Because, yeah, that's a problem. Um, so let's do substrate purge chain. Is there, okay, and then we can run the chain again. So we're starting from zero, starting from scratch. We'll sit here. Any questions so far? Maybe we can answer some questions if there are any. Things about events, things about what we've done here. Yeah, question. Can uh, contracts can call contracts? Not yet. But So technically they can, and it's implemented under the hood. It's just not yet supported by Ink. But it will be. We're working on it. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, in the back. Can you maybe um, highlight the differences between a runtime and a smart contract? Yeah, I can try my best. Um, yeah, so th I think the, the, there's a lot of things to talk about between runtime and smart contract. And we'll actually, I think, hopefully have some blog posts which talk about the differences between the two. Um, runtime is a much lower level uh, functionality on your blockchain. It, it, the, the runtime modules are supposed to be like the core execution logic of your blockchain, uh, taking things, you know, the state transition function, all that kind of stuff. It's not meant for like users to interact with it. It's not meant to track like the, the computational spending, like gas fees or something like that. It's not meant to be safe and to revert. As you might have known if you've done module development, if you, make a, if you put something in storage, it's there. And if, you, if 
the, somewhere later your execution fails, then um, you're stuck with some bad state. Um, and uh, additionally, if you put some like for loop inside of your module and you allow the user to put some arbitrary stuff in there, the user can put whatever amount of storage they want, they can put whatever amount of loops they want, and they will never get charged for that because there's no fee system within the modules, right? So now we're talking about like, okay, I want to maybe build some, some module, but allow users from the outside world to interact and play with it. Imagine, imagine something like, you know, you have to be at the balances module, which is a very low level, very safe. We have, we make sure all the checks are happening in there. We wouldn't want people to, you know, add other modules which directly touch the balance module. Instead, you can build contracts like this um, on top of the balances module, which allows a kind of a safe playground for your blockchain to allow users to interact. And there's always this, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Where you know you get you get charged for what you do. So it, it it's uh, it's it costs you to attack the system. It costs you to do these things. Um, additionally, um, I think the module system is not meant to to provide these like user interfaces. It's not meant to like I know a lot of people maybe in this room have tried to store like strings and try to like return strings and stuff like that from from the module. And that's not what it's for. A string like you know like your name or something like that is never part of the core uh, blockchain logic. But um, for more like user friendly stuff, for more like interactive stuff, things like contracts is a good place for those things to exist and those things to live. So you might imagine that if you're trying to build some like very specific like um, DAP chain where you have some uh, product, maybe and let's imagine like something like Substrate Kitties, right? As a module, maybe there's a module, maybe it shouldn't, but let's say it lives as a module. You may want to allow users to then build smart contracts on top of the Substrate Kitties chain to introduce things like auctions or introduce things like. Um, you know, trading or whatever, like some kind of decentralized exchange for this asset which lives on the blockchain. But you wouldn't want necessarily users to do a runtime upgrade and push these things directly to the module because, you know, it's maybe not safe. Um, did I miss any other points? Does that, does that, is that a generally good answer? Yeah. Um, I, there might be some more um, fine details here, but um, I think, uh, again, the one thing to really look at and one of the things I think a lot of mistakes that happen around um, runtime development is that, um, Runtime modules are not meant to be this like happy user interface, like safe thing. It's a very low level. It's meant to be able to easily create and execute these uh, uh, efficient uh, runtime operations. And contracts are meant to be the exactly opposite. That, they, that they're safe, that they're slower, that they have this gas thing. It's like it's way more um, costly to use them. Yeah, okay. So we have this, we built the thing. We have all these uh, WASM files in the JSON for the ERC-20. So let's now deploy it. So one of these, Things is my, yeah, let's use this one. Sure. And let's open this tab. Yeah, so we have a block, it's producing block things. Um, so let's go back to contracts. Um, to yeah, I don't, I don't have to clear, I think, I think it'll be fine. So you can see here in the, it, it remembered, um, yeah, this is another, another small bug, but in general, as you deploy more and more contracts, it'll remember what contracts you deployed and will have things like what is the address of the contract, so when you call it, it can, um, you can call directly without having to remember all these fine details. Really nice. Um, so we have Alice again. We're gonna deploy our uh, new contracts. So go to desktop, go to ERC20, go to target. Oh my gosh, what are you doing, Mac? Um, target, go to pruned. We're using the pruned one. And we can see the name is ERC20 pruned. We can name whatever we want. We input the ABI file and we do 500,000 gas. Let's deploy this. Okay, and good. Now we're gonna have Alice go and instantiate this contract. So the, this oh this is the call, I'm sorry, instance. We're gonna have Alice instantiate this contract with some initial values. So we can have Alice um, have some balance. Does anyone wanna pick a number, 42? Yeah, let's do 42. Um, and then endowment, uh, again we have to do 1,000 to make sure that the account for the contract doesn't get um, removed by the existential deposit. And then maximum gas allowed will do 500,000 again. Instantiate, so here Alice will create a ERC20 token where she has initial balance of 42. So let's talk about this. So let's do balance of Alice. And we would expect to see the number 42 appear on our console. Um, maximum gas allowed, let's do 100,000. And somewhere here, did it work? Oh, see, I think I used too few gas here. So this is a, a small of the problem. So let's do 500,000. The, the whole gas metering right now is a little bit, I'm not, not in a happy spot, but this is still really new, so it's okay. Yeah, so this one works. We put more gas and we see here, there is ERC20 balance of, of this account is 42. Cool. Now let's transfer some balance, right? So the cool thing is let's transfer from Alice to Bob. Um, we'll do 13 and we'll call this transfer function. Um, and you can see here there's an event 
event contract. I want to see if I can see it in the Explorer, if it's if it caught it, but ooh, no. Um, you have to call it again. Maybe I can call it again and then show it to you. Yeah. Um, let me just call this. I can call 13. I can do the exact same call one more time. So I'll, I'm sending 26 total to Bob now. Yes, and then if we look here, there's a um, event contract contract. You can see it has this blob of bytes, and this would eventually be the um, the we would be able to decode it and be the, the happy um, uh, structure that we've established for our, our event, right? Um, but we've sent 26, and so then what I would expect to do is then go to balance of, look at Bob, call this. Hopefully we haven't run out of gas yet. Oh no, I think we're, we're out of balance. This is so awkward. Let me see, what does it say here? It's, yeah, two free, no, two free, yeah, but it's, it's because Alice ran out of funds again. Um, actually, we can do this, we can call bounce up from any account. So I think Alice stash also has some stuff, right? So this bounce function doesn't have, oh, no, how about Bob? Does Bob have some funds? Yeah, let's do this one. Bob, Bob, do you have funds? Yes, Bob has funds, yay. And we can go down and we can see here balance of, Bob is 26. And then I will save you all the transfer from because that's annoying. But you see it works, and you can see that events are being emitted, and all this cool stuff is happening, and it's on Substrate. Yeah. Cool. So, amazingly, I'm done early, and so we can sit here and ask questions, and we can even have Sergey come back up here if you have questions about the contract module, or if you have questions about the language, or if you have questions about future plans, or maybe we can, maybe if you want people to relax and get some free time, we can do that too, up to, yeah. Yeah. Let me, how can I show? Um, yeah, is there or will there be a way um, yeah, to find out which like functions and events will be exposed uh, uh, through the RPC uh, uh, client? Uh, so right now, the only way that our events are like um, told to the world is through that JSON ABI. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, technically, if you—I mean, if you're building a blockchain, you're a blockchain developer. You could probably add this. This is probably something that's doable. Sure, sure it's doable. But I—I I don't. I'm not sure if we're going to do that right now. I think, yeah, okay, let's yeah. Sergey talk. Um, so this is actually an interesting question because, like, um, so this implies that this ABI descriptions will have to be alongside with the um, contract code itself so they can uh, should be deployed on the chain and I'm not sure if this is actually something that like uh, people will use often and um, yeah but I, I would go with the kind of you know off chain uh, distribution of this uh, like ABI files. Okay, yeah, because I'm, I'm wondering if you want to build like an interface on this like smart contracts in a like in a generic way, this would be useful. Yeah, uh, yeah, I understand. So uh, there, like, I think this is something that we want to do to have, but like not the way that the chain contains all these ABI definitions because it's rather you know uh, heavy. Yeah, uh, the scheme like current uh, Ethereum has where like, basically you can provide source code to Block Explorer and it will compile your source code and check if it's actually uh, corresponds to the contract uh, in question and then we, it will also get this ABI definitions and then it will like uh, use that instead of uh, like um, containing all this ABI stuff on chain. Uh, again, one of the great things, one of the reasons why the ERC-20 standard is so powerful is because it gives a uh, solid or like a uh, consistent AP, um, ABI across all the contracts to deploy it. So, you know, I would expect there to be similar standards built here and then you'd have ABIs which, um, which help you define the access to multiple contracts without having to store them on chain, right? Yeah. We have another question up front and over here too, yeah. Yeah, say you have um, uh, the need for crypto primitives, for example, that you don't want to pack into your smart contract. Uh, would that be a good idea to consider having that in the runtime and then accessing this primitive from your smart contract? Is that how that would be done and how would we do that? So, if I understand this correctly, you ask about 
uh, like how would we deal with some new crypto primitives like I know like, yeah like so, a new hash for example yeah so this is a tricky question actually um, basically I really hope that the governance compilation thing that I mentioned uh, in overview overview part uh, will help us here basically like not relying to like extending substrate uh, for like these functions. But yeah, if it won't work out, uh, like I mean, if it's not enough or we uh, at some point we realize that some of this kind of on-chain like uh, governance, even governance approved uh, functions are not enough, um, then probably this will be a good uh, like um, point to consider them to embed into the substrate host itself. There's a problem of like we can't uh, basically ex like add uh, every possible uh, function to the substrate host. Uh, let's start with that. Um, with the fact that every implementation of substrate, and I expect, I, I really hope there will be more than one. Uh, we'll have to like re implement this extrinsics, and this is not ah, actually there is uh, already more than one uh, Rust and J uh, JavaScript. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of. I I don't know if this was part of the question, but it kind of sounded like it that it's not necessarily that you write your new primitive in like as a precompile in Substrate, but that it's part of the runtime outside of the contract sandbox. And there's obviously some benefits to that in that it's it's then trusted code and you can you can compile that, you can do whatever you want, you can run the native version. It's still within your runtime, but you might still be able to run it natively. But then the question is how does the contract module interact with this other module that has these primitives? I don't know if that's built in in the current version, um, but it should be extensible to, to allow that. We had some ideas uh, around um, linking contracts dynamically to other contracts and code. So, for example, the entire or some parts of Inc. Core could also live on, on the runtime and being just linked dynamically onto the contract instead of being compiled into every contract, which is some kind of boilerplate right now. And we are investigating that, and it would be a nice idea or a nice solution. Any other questions? Um, can you restrict which accounts can uh, add code to the blockchain? Maybe in the Genesis config with a pseudo account or something? Um, that's... Uh, okay, what do you mean by adding a code, like... Yeah, I mean, the, the first step was always um, uh, deploying the, the ABI and, and the actual bytecode uh, to the blockchain. And in our case, we, we would like to restrict that maybe so that um, the, only the foundation can, can add code, but everyone can execute it and has uh, mm. ability to, to execute and pay fees if it takes too long and stuff like that. Uh, okay, actually, I think uh, this is technically possible. I mean, uh, you will have to just, uh, just. <laughs> yeah, just uh, somehow constrain uh, this function of put code to be only co uh, called by s approved entities. For example, like uh, maybe you can write another module which just drops uh, the uh, you know the the uh, smart contract module and uh, just does this additional checks. But yeah. Uh, it's not something that is um, uh, already uh, supported uh, out of box, but it's not that something that's really hard to implement. I, I, I think. Uh, I think you would take a sort of take the staking module and modify it to be maybe not staking, but like the authority set that you feel like should be able to deploy, and then have that interact with the contracts module. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a super expert on the contracts module, but I, again, uh, one of the things to know is the contracts module is just the module. So if you all done module development, you're familiar with different uh, uh, origins. So you can have like um, insure, uh, insure signed root, um, 
inherent and then root, right? So if you want to do something that only the pseudo module can call this, you could probably just change this one line from ensure sign to ensure root, and you prob probably just works. Like, it would be your own version of the contracts module, but it would probably just be a literal one, not even one liner, it's a one worder, right? Um, yeah, just because so that's, uh, yeah, you can always modify uh, like contract module, but you know, it would be more uh, uh, like, it will be better if you stick to the original implementation uh, to get all these nice upgrades if there are any, any and just wrap, like do this uh, checking like outside, just wrap the uh, contract module with another module. Um, I guess it's kind of vague at the moment right now, but do you do you have any sort of idea of what it might cost to do, for example, an ERC twenty transfer in terms of like a sort of real world cost? Or there's there's not really like a gas schedule that you guys have devised yet, right? Um, uh, yeah, actually the gas metering part is like something that is not really worked out yet. I mean, uh, like the basic, uh, basically the operations mostly have costs like one or like just random values like 500 or something. Um, but yeah, uh, now like it's, it's kind of, I, I don't have an idea how it uh, will look like in the future. I mean, this also has something to do with the economics or the like denominations and maybe it will differ between uh, different chains, like different instantiations of SML contract. Like, um, I, uh, like it's worth noting that SML contract and as well as ink is not the final product like I mean it's not like final chain but it's kind of prefab that you can use in your chain and you can uh, set up it differently or maybe some people uh, would like to extend it and they might end up with completely different schedule yeah um, just uh, another question um, so it's in the context of, of polka dot is, is there going to be some sort of canonical parachain that will be able, basically be the place where people will generally want to put contracts or is it kind of expected that every single parachain is going to want to deploy their own um, contracts module? Um, because it, it, it seems like if, if you have a sort of standard contracts module, um, like, you kind of want, or maybe it's a bad idea, but it, it sounds like you could have one canonical parachain where, um, where people would just go to and deploy their own contracts, or is, is, is that not really the idea behind um, the contracts module? Uh, this is a really good question, and I'm afraid that I can't answer it because uh, this is, I, I mean, uh, this will be up to these people who uh, will actually deploy parachains and I don't have an idea who that people will be and how, uh, like, how they will compete for the name of the, like, the canonical smart contract chain and, yeah, so my understanding of this, like, or rather my hope how it will work out uh, that um, a SRML contract is like basically a stepping stone for contract development and it's not something that's super like, I mean super like the, let's say the period that will like the king of all uh, contract chains or something. I actually hope that people will use this uh, smart contract platform for creating um, better contract platforms with their own ideas uh, and different limitations and so people could explore different uh, paths um, like with, with this kind of platform. So, yeah. Yeah, I, like, 
Polkadot will not have like this this one smart contract chain that is the like that is special in any way and like is the 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 one. Um, so it, it is up to the people building it to to make that happen. I expect that you know just through network effects there will probably be smart contract chains that are more popular than others. And I don't expect every chain to have a smart contract aspect to them. Like there are great use cases for not having any smart contract stuff at all. Um, and I know there, there's actually several teams here today that are building smart contract chains. And I know there are different plans and different models you know, in how they want to approach it. So this is one model. Um, there's like an OCAP model of, of smart contracts as well that people are exploring. And so I, I expect there to be several different ones with some variations in how they work. Any other questions? All right, we'll take some take some break, a little bit of a longer break. We'll meet back up at uh, 442. Yeah, one, one thing I just, um, yeah, this is available. So um, hopefully we get that tiny CC link working, but if not, you can, you know, find this uh, workshop and it's still a little bit not quite finished 100%, but I would expect by the week to be finished. And as you know from, if you've worked with the Subject Kitties workshop, I'm super interested in getting feedback, um, pull requests, issues, um, additions to the thing. Maybe we can add an ERC721 um, uh, chapter to this so that all these things would be really great. Uh, if you want to go over this content yourself, if you weren't able to follow along here today, you can do so. So please do. And give us feedback. Yeah. Like this is all new stuff. We're super interested in hearing what you guys think about it. If it looks cool, if ink looks cool and nice and good to work with, or if it's terrible, uh, let us know. The same counts for the repository of uh, ink language. We are ha very happy to accept any contribution and okay. be your part in it. Thirty tech slash ink. Parity text slash ink. There you go. Uh, cool. So we'll take a bit of a break. Uh, I have a sort of uh, note as well. Uh, if you're drinking from bottles, put the bottles back into the like bins, the crates, not into the trash because we get a rebate on them. So we don't want you to throw it in trash. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, put it back in the crates. Thank you. <laughs>